I've always hung out with people that were gay or in question or wherever they were on the sexual spectrum. Just having friends outside of people that are that identify as straight. That's always been me. But as a black man, that's that wasn't ever cool. And you're hanging out with people that are going to hell. That's that's an abomination. Wow. To step outside of that and to rub against the grain. It's hard no matter what. I'm Cindy Darnell, and welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, cultural, political, and other lenses, and discover ways to solve some very diverse and stimulating erotic quandaries. Today's guest is Greg Dawson. Greg is a licensed clinical social worker employed at the Dallas VA as a case manager and therapist treating Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. Greg began Kaya, a sex therapy-based private practice, and Compassion, an education and sexual expression site for all genders, cultures, and races. Do I call you Greg? Do I call you Gregory? Do I, what do call I, me what? Greg. Greg. Call me Greg. Greg. Yes. So, Greg, I'm really glad to meet you in this context. And I guess, like, for folks listening, it's important for them to know that I, you know, I, I found you on the internet. I tracked you down. Um, <laughs> and I tracked you down specifically because I, you know, I was really interested in you and your work. And so... Based on that alone, given that you really are a complete stranger to me, um, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to acknowledge that, and also really thank you for taking an hour and a bit out of your day to to um, to dedicate to to making this podcast, the Erotic Philosopher, with me. So thank you, I, I really appreciate it. Well, Cindy, thank you for having me. Anytime I have the opportunity to talk about sex, to talk about. Uh, who I am and to grow from it and to also build and to create resources, build resources, that and so much more. I take that opportunity every time. So, um, it, again, thank you for having me. And I just want to have some fun. Oh, cool. Well, I guess that we're a bit of a hand and a glove in that respect, because that's certainly what has motivated me. So before we kind of get into anything, especially kind of, you know, thick or rich or visceral about sex and pleasure and, and the human condition, how how would you describe yourself and your work and if there are gaps between them? Who are you, Greg? Thank you. Um, I am a black man from the South. Uh, I am a black man that uh, grew up in a military family. So I've kind of traveled around a little bit uh, early on before uh, coming right back down to the South and living life as it is here with the humid hot and sometimes cold, you, this, this tricky weather down here, all that, all the great things that come with the South. Uh, before I come, um, moving down uh, to the Dallas area, uh, I'm a sex therapist. Uh, my day job is working at the VA, working with veterans that come back from war, doing mental health assessments, family assessments, assessments, getting them resources that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then after that, I, um, I work for a, a Medicare company uh, doing therapy with people uh, that qualify for Medicare, of course. Uh, and that ranges from, it's usually later ages, of course, but they're really sick people usually. But I've had uh, a range of different cultures and customs as far as, you know, black, white, Hispanic, just a number of people, different types of people, disabled, right. uh, of course. And so uh, I think that's really been rich and really where I've, I've served and done a lot of work with uh, a number of black men. Okay, okay. And that's not necessarily in a sex therapy context, that work. That's that's more your general counseling or social work context. Absolutely. Right. Uh, but, you know, what tends, what I tend to find out is that, it, you know, life, it leads over into the bedroom in so many ways. Everything does. Yeah. And, you know, I'm talking to you about this healthcare issue and depression, and you still want your sex life, not realizing how much of a, uh, you know, how much, you know, your healthcare and your mental health is playing into the bed. And so we, we tend, it tends to be sex therapy anyway. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, so we tend to do a lot of work there. And so I have my, my own private practice, which is fairly new, uh, but it, I'm still getting work done. And I also work with sex offenders. So I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of work. So, I mean, that's just an interesting thing, and I, let's veer off in that direction momentarily. Certainly in the work that I do, I don't work with 
uh, known or, or, you know, established sex offenders. I have done a lot of work with the, uh, the recipients of the violence, the, the people who've been the receivers of violence and abuse, but never with the offenders. How is that? I'm, I'm curious because that's an element of, of the work that I, do, I have never done and I don't do. Um, but I really respect and admire the folks who do do it. Well, it's something I, I'd never really considered uh, early on. I went to Florida State University. I remember a lot of my cohort talking about how they don't want to work with sex offenders and that they can't. You know, you have to know your borders, your boundaries, things and people and mm. uh, just backgrounds you can't work with. Right. Experiences you can't work with. And that was really the leading one for most of my friends and uh, colleagues coming up. But I found myself working with them indirectly, whether they're on papers, off paper. Uh, when I say on or off papers, uh, if, if you're going through the court system, you're going to be on papers. If you're off paper, you, you've probably gone through the court system or you haven't registered to some degree. But I found myself working with them and there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation and misunderstanding when it comes to a sex offender. You know, what they've done to the degree that they've done it, how many times they've done it, what age did they do it? and who they've offended. So many questions. But, you know, we can get to a point where we're working with these people. It's a safer it's a safer community. Absolutely. It's such an important piece of work. I know that we don't get specific training in it if you're doing a general therapy program. If you're gonna tra- if you're gonna work in that field, you've got to get separate training. Yep. And I imagine that the burnout rate would be pretty high if you're working in that context all the time. M- maybe not. It's funny you say that. Just in Texas alone, I think there's North Texas where I'm at, there's under 10 sex offender treatment providers. So, and there's about, uh, in the state of Texas, about 40,000 offenders to be released to the community over between now and the next year. So we just don't have enough of people to serve the area. Wow. So so yes, burnout is real when it comes to that because there's, there's a lot going on. You, if, you can find, if you want work, you can find work here. Um, and then it typically sticks around because these sentences and charges t- are going to stick around, you know. So um, so definitely what you have to do, uh, the stories that you have to hear, um, the way you're trying to help get someone to become aware of what they've done, who they are as a person and their charges. A lot of energy does go into that and, and can lead to burnout early if you're not if you don't have enough help, if you don't have a, a good enough system set up to to allow yourself to get that, you know, balance. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of leads me to my next question then. How do you take care of yourself when you're working? People ask me that all the time. Look, I I work seven days a week, right? You do? I work seven days a week. Wow. Well, I'm trying to set up my, my retirement plan. I'm living in an apartment. You know, I'm not struggling by any means, but, you know, I want, I want this, this, this picture for myself, this future for myself. And so, um, I take I take a million breaks a day. <laughs> uh, I also do uh, exercises. I make sure that I run thirty minutes uh, minimum, no matter how hard or soft or, or it doesn't matter how strenuous the the the, uh, the workout is. It just has to be thirty minutes of cardio at the very minimum, so that releases endorphins and you feel better. Yeah. So that can help regulate your mood. So I don't I don't want to be going around. My, my co-workers pissed off and all this other stuff and I got to get work done. Who, want, who wants that around them, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, I try to make sure that my cardio is about 30 minutes minimum. I make sure that I'm around my family and friends all the time uh, when I get off of work or when I have free time. So although I work seven days a week, it looks like, okay, he's not really working. He has nothing going on, but I'm literally working my ass off. And, you know, you, you create balance by what you like to do who you like to be around and mm-hmm. when you can just sit up and just kind of breathe and, uh, and just relax. I just, I find, I find a break in everything that I do. So it allows me to, to work seven days a week. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important in order to sustain oneself doing, you know, this kind of work in, in whatever capacity, knowing how to manage your energy levels and, and, yes. and so, I mean, so much of it is to me anyway, you know, practicing what I preach. So when I'm telling people how to have better sex, when I'm telling people how to, you know, do this and don't do that and blah, 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 where in general therapy, you might not be doling out advice so much. You tend to be more kind of listening and and reframing and helping folks come to their own conclusions. My 
experience with sex therapy is that there are really fundamental pieces of information that folks just do not have. They do not have it and they won't come to those realizations by themselves. So you have to you have to scaffold it for them a lot more yes. than you do in regular therapy. And I think that's one of the big distinctions and, and why, you know, regular therapists can sometimes unintentionally create more problems for people seeking sex advice because if the therapist is not informed or the counsellor is not informed, they can give information to clients that's, you know, just based on what they reckon, not actually based on on what the, what the data says or, you know, best practice and any of that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, society can end up perpetuating some of these sex myths and making people feel sometimes worse about themselves than when they started if, if you're, you know, working with somebody who's, really not across sex in in ways that is um is really useful that's not you're not just sort of doling out information from men's and women's magazines i absolutely agree the piece where people aren't really talking about sex because they don't know about sex you know a lot of that is you know i hate to blame this but a lot of that is uh trauma culture a lot of that is christian or religious culture mm. uh that i have to go up against all the time so that's an interesting thing like let's just, like pause there and talk about that because i think that i mean certainly religion is not unique to the united states but the degree to which it informs people's lives is very unique here in ways that i've not seen in other uh, English speaking countries, let's, let's say. So for me working in New York city, I experience clients who are, you know, Christian, Jewish, whatever, some variation, Muslim. Um, but generally that, that is not the f thing that they start with, you know, they'll, they'll start more with, you know, I want to do this, or I feel like that, or I'm having this relationship problem. And then the religion stuff comes through underneath that. When you're saying so, working you know in the South, that you're up against that religion. Tell me more about how that informs and influences your work with sex therapy. Well, I think the South has a religious mouthpiece. It's kind of expected. Okay, this this person is Christian, or and if they, you know, the South is kind of becoming more of a melting pot in certain areas. And so we're, we're broadening our scope as far as understanding what other religions look like and feel like. But down here, it, even if you're not religious, you know, you kind of get the, the behavior or you kind of get the thought and the mindset what has been set as a standard by religion. So for, for me, for, for instance... I've always been black all my life and male, right? And straight. And so, <laughs> but I grew up uh, in a Christian household and I got the talk from my parents about sex at a much early, at a, at a much earlier age. And let me, let me not say parents, by my mother. She worked in, um, she worked in a, uh, in a clinic, in a sex clinic, in a uh, military base. And so she was always on top of things. Figuratively speaking, not literally. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so she would always bless me with information on what I needed to do, what I don't need to do, what I need to be aware of. So would you say your mum was quite kind of open-minded and or liberal about, about sex in particular? Yes. And she's a devout Christian. And so she is kind of not the norm. Wow. So to get it from her and to also help my friends whose parents were devout Christians, or if they weren't, they still had the mindset that you shouldn't be talking about this. Mm. But they, my friends had all the questions. And I don't know if you've seen the movie or the, the, uh, the series Sex Education. I think it's a wonderful series. Yes, I love it. I too. love it, man. And so... Side note, there need to be more straight men that have gay friends. Yes. They, we just learn so much uh, from from different genders and sexes. Yeah. And people that want to have sex with same sex or whatever you want out there. But, you know, I think straight men need to get out of only straight friends only, that kind of thing there. Not, for, for a large part. Uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I love, the, I love their relationship. They, they, they support each other. They get angry with each other. It's it's a normal relationship. Yeah, no, they're like buddies who just happen to be what they are. And yeah. yeah. And so coming up, that was that was kind of me. 
right? Um, so I would give, I wasn't doing sex therapy, but I was giving people tidbits on notes and books that I had. Yeah, right. So you were the guy that people came to with their sex problems. Yeah. Aww. And so, or at least a question or two or a few. And then uh, if not, then I deferred to mom and then we'd have that laugh or whatever. But also just having friends outside of people that are that identify as straight. I've always hung out with people that were gay uh, or in question or wherever they were on the sexual spectrum. That's that's always been me. But as a black man, that's that wasn't ever cool. And often I'll be considered gay. Right. I'll be considered feminine or weak. You're hanging. You're hanging out with people that are going to hell. That's a, that's an abomination. Wow. Did folks actually say that to you, or was that the implication? They actually said it. Yeah, that's said. It. It's it's comfortable to cite and say that, uh, particularly in the South. You know, you grow up with that, and at some point, as a, as a young kid, you accept it. Well, let me just say, not everybody, but I, for me, I did because that's just you accepted you were going to hell. If I had friends that were gay. And then that was an issue for me. I was like, I, this guy is cool or this person is cool, but this is what the Bible says and this is what my teachings are saying. And so, you know, I had to grow up and I had to realize what was said in front of me, people who were amazing folks. And so I had to give up Christianity and I'm spiritual now, but uh, I've, I've been spiritual for a while now, not just yesterday or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had I had to give that up. Because I, I want to have my relationship with my friends and God, you know, yeah. and so all the all the dumb ass shit in between. I can't I can't keep having that issue. But that's kind of a, a kind of the feeling you get in the South. It's that's that's that kind of thing. there. So you have to do some pretty heavy duty self inquiry at that point when your entire not just your your community, but also your identity, you know, because I mean, if I'm talking to you about being a straight black man in the South, is it fair for me to assume that straight black men are pretty much kind of enculturated into being, into being Christian, into being anti-gay, into that that's, would that be true of, of straight black men in the South, do you think? Or is it particularly concentrated where you were growing up? Yes. It's, it's, it's not concentrated where I grew up. It's, that's just kind of the thing. That's just how it is, right? That's just, that's just kind of how it is. Uh, people are indoctrinated in the belief that this is the way it is. Don't challenge it. That this is what's right. And if you do, you're gay or you're an abomination. You're going to hell. Yeah. So for you to separate yourself from that, I imagine that must have taken a shit ton of courage and some real kind of, you know, dark nights of the soul for you to work out, you know, the the cost and deficit analysis if, if if i give up this entire cultural community that i'm a part of that i love dearly what's the benefits what's the cost yeah like you know what, what where's that gonna leave me i mean what's yeah. it like to have to to make a choice like that you get a rid of a piece of you that you should closely identify with because with christianity comes uh the way people eat dress and have a conversation with other folks right just how you socialize and who you hang around. That's a lot of things that you're going to have to consider giving up and much, much more, right? So Christianity is not just defined by those few things, but so much more. But I had to look, I had to, I think, I had to think deeper. I had to think about, you know, am I going to continue to have these struggles? I, I struggled with Christianity and sex and who I wanted to be. Well, not as a straight black man, but just who I wanted to be as far as like hanging around and, being comfortable in my skin mm. as a straight black man. I know people might be saying like, oh, wow, woe is me. He's he's suffering as a, I'm not saying I'm suffering as a straight black guy, but uh, but definitely the the understanding as to who I am or who I was coming up to, to, to today was, it was generally a struggle. And thank God I had two parents that were very supportive. I played sports. I took it out on people that were my opposition. And not only that, you know, just in relationships, I think you need to have that spirituality piece that serves as having a better understanding of you so you can give the best part of you to that union of whatever sort, that, that your partner of whatever kind. Yeah. And so I generally didn't have a relationship with with women when I was when I told them, you know, I no longer believe in this and that and I'm spiritual. 
typically a lot of black women just didn't really deal with me. Some did, but for the ones that I, that I felt like were great, a great match for me, it wasn't working. We weren't enemies, but they, they just kind of, you know. That was a deal breaker for them. Yeah, it was a deal breaker. And so I, I prided myself in letting them know that early so we can know how to move forward together or not. And then I can only imagine what it's like to be a gay black man or woman or person uh, in the South. It would be a whole extra level of stuff you'd you'd be going through on top of that. So the fact that so many straight black folks, and I am sure this is probably true in the white and, and Asian communities and stuff as well, that, you know, to 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 go to rub against the grain, whatever that is, from wherever you are, um, to 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 step outside of that, you know, it's hard no matter what. Absolutely. And then you add sex into the mix, and then you have a whole other, you know, bowl of you know complications because sex globally, globally, people freak the fuck out about sex so not only did you renounce your christianity and embrace your kind of you know libertarian sort of queer ally side in addition to still maintaining an allegiance to black community and then you became a sex therapist <laughs> yeah why did you become a sex i mean i know why i became a sex therapist but i don't know <laughs> why did you become a sex therapist I think a lot of sex therapists start out with, I like sex, right? Yes. So I don't know. Of course. People so, say that to me. They're like, Cindy, why did you become a sex therapist? And I'm like, is sex not the most fucking fascinating thing in the world? Is it not the most extraordinary thing in the world? Is it not the thing that everybody's curious about? Not everybody wants to talk about it, but everybody's curious about it. 100% facts. <laughs> so, so there's that. You know, I, I've, I've always been open to sex, always open to learning about sex. And my favorite person in the world, my mom, like I said, worked in a, in a sex clinic, always giving me information. As I grew up, I've always done, you know, trying to see like like porn or or always interested in the industry, how that would look. In the porn industry? Yes. Do you want to be a porn actor? Oh, that was, I, I wanted to be when I was young. Oh, okay. You grew out of that. That's That's real work. <laughs> No, I'm asking. No, yeah, really. I, I, quite a few of my friends are porn performers. I know that it's, yeah, I know what goes on behind the scenes. Yes. But also being interested in different cultures and races um, and wanting to have sex with people who were black, people who weren't black. And, and as I did, just understanding, trying to find a difference, trying to find similarities and just enjoying it too. I felt like there was so much education through sex and, um, you know, you don't, I didn't really realize the benefits of sex until like mid twenties, how, you know, mood or health improvements or just how you can get along and, and help find ways to build a relationship with, with the, your significant other, so on and so forth. And just, just the skim of the uh, surface of things. So I start realizing the benefits of it and like, bam, okay. Are there any guys out there that look like me that are sex therapists? Right. So I start looking. No, it's not. It's not many at all. Why do you think that is? Well, one of the things you hit on was, you know, people don't really talk about it, but they they're very intrigued. They have all these questions. They're motivated to learn, but they're not motivated to follow through to see what's going on with sex, their sex and what their brand of sex is. If it's accepted, will other people be OK? So, you know, there's the shame culture. There's the Christianity or religious culture out there. Um, I think that holds a lot of black men back. I know a lot of my friends, associates, I should say, would be like, we don't do this, man. What you, what you, what you doing? Like, like just be a regular therapist. I'm like, nah, I, I, I like, I like this. And this is what I'm going to do. And that's also why I'm doing this. So, yeah. you know, yeah. down the road, your kids or your kids' kids can be open. We can increase their quality of life so they can enjoy it. But just creating more spaces for black men to have the real in-depth conversation as about as to about who we are yeah. with our friends. Like I have about two to three really good, or I'll say best friends. We talk about sex. We talk about what we're doing with women, right? We talk about our failures in the bed. We talk about <laughs> our success. We talk about, man, I, just all the things that you what you need to know and learn from somebody else. Yeah, I talk to them about that. 
but I can't go out and talk, have that regular type of conversation with, with another black man. I'm curious, what would happen, hypothetically, of course, what might happen if you did? I think that they would definitely uh, get points and tips on how to extend life, how to extend pleasure, how to, again, quality of life would be increased. But this is how it goes down when I'm talking to just men in general and then, and then brothers, right? So, so you're just sitting around in a bar, watching football, eating eating fries, and you say, hey, you know. Like, look, she got <laughs> ass on her, man. And he'll turn around, yeah, I saw her when I came in. I'm thinking about fucking tonight. I'm like, dude, you, you're like 70 years old, man. You, you, you're struggling to get out of this bar tonight. But anyway, I appreciate that. But um, so that's, that's really what's going on. And typically, you know, you're not going to talk about sex failures at the uh at the bar but but then again you can you know if you're in a bar and there's nobody else there it's fine um i've actually i come i came across i think he was a hispanic male and he just kind of opened up and i told him you know my background what i do and then he talked about his diet and how he's having cholesterol and i think high blood pressure issues or something like that and how the medication affects with you know um the strength of his penis, uh, how erect it is, how he's it's ta- it's hard for him to carry through, all that stuff there. And so he was looking for answers, he was looking for help, but he didn't want therapy. But he he wanted some free shit. But you know, uh, but I really appreciated the fact that he and I were able to sit down and have that conversation. I didn't know him from a can of whatever, you know, dirt or salt or soda or whatever. So he just appeared, he was in the bar, and then you guys just started, and then he started talking about his blood pressure and his dick, and you <laughs> kind of ran with it. Which, that's, you know, that's a weird. Because, no, it's not weird, darling, because you know why? Women talk like that all the time. Women, you know, you're sitting in a bar, or you're in the, probably, maybe not in the bar so much, but in the bathroom, you know, redoing your lipstick or whatever, and it's like, you know, oh, I don't have a tampon. Do you have a tampon I could use? Women would say that. Like, that would be not that wouldn't be weird it wouldn't be creepy it wouldn't be you know anything or you know your butt looks great in those leggings or you know we would say that without a second thought about what it implied whether uh, you know we were straight or queer or whatever just to to just be having those conversations between women who you don't know would happen on the regular i would say that that, that you know, and what I discover, certainly in the work that I've done with dudes, particularly around stuff like erection problems and um, ejaculation problems, which are probably the two things that will initiate someone coming to see me and maybe you too. And I say to these guys, have you told anybody about this? No, never. They don't even tell their partners. I mean, the partners probably know because they are there, Yeah. you know, but they don't talk about it. And that's, and that's, exactly why I got in. You know, I just needed to create more spaces for black men to do that. It's, it's sad that I can only say, I think I haven't even had the sex talk with my father, uh, where, you know, we talk about how successful or unsuccessful he's been in bed, but I have been with my friends. You know, I've told, I've talked to them about my failures plenty of times, uh, and they've talked to me about theirs. And so, you know, I want to create that space for black men so we can get better and, and do great things have been now you know for the for the lot of us there's a lot of guys out there black guys out there having great sex but there's also some that aren't right and so where do they go um are they asking the guys that are having great sex no they're not yeah and they're not asking they're not going to a therapist uh, a regular therapist to talk about you know having sexual issues of whatever kind so yeah so it, it has to start somewhere and so why not with me yeah you know, and, and the fact that there are so few black men in this work, you know, period, there are even fewer straight black men in this work. It's, I, I can only imagine that the stigma and the, the cultural hoops you guys have to jump over are so great because the work is so valuable. And I know that there are a lot of really, you know, powerful, thoughtful, inspiring black men who are doing social justice work and doing other kinds of, you know, liberation work. But so few of them are doing sex-based work, not sex work, but, you know, working around social justice issues and pleasure, which leads me to think that the, the, 
the hurdles to to get over and the and the extraordinary labor that folks like you and and you know James Watley are doing to reconstruct places for black men to have these conversations on their own terms is is really phenomenal and, and let me just say i hope to feel james wiley's shoes if he whenever he retires he he's <laughs> he is a hard working brother he um, sure is there's room in the world for both of you yeah yeah and that's, more that's, that's true. and that's more true. and it doesn't know, have to hope... be either or that's right yeah yeah that's yeah right. if there are more black men who are listening to us talking to the on this podcast who are like hmm I think I want to go and do this work. I'm like, come, I let me push the door open for yeah. you. Come on in. Yeah. Because we need this. We need this. This is such a such a female dominated industry. Such a um white and, and female. Then, white and female. And then when there are men, they're um mostly gay white men, occasionally by white men, but mostly gay. Increasing numbers of non-binary and trans folks are coming in, which is great. Absolutely. And then, but I think the straight black men are the smallest in number and that needs to change. Yeah. I I know quite a few, but I don't know, you know, I can't, I, I just have to agree. This, this is a very small number of us. I'm not going to throw out the numbers who I think it, because that doesn't really matter, but I would hope, my hope is to increase the number of black men, whether you're straight, gay, or however you identify. I just want to increase the number of black men in this field. And I think that in and of itself can do so much work for us, uh, especially in the South, uh, but in all the corners of the United States and the world too. Uh, but just starting right here in the United States before we do anything on a global level, that's that's a lot of work. But that would do so much to help us become comfortable in our skin help us to challenge all these scripts, these old these old expectations of what a black man is and what a black man should do. It will definitely allow us to participate with the leaders in the sex field and and to make a more comprehensive history book and plan for, for more people that look like everybody. I definitely want to widen the, the range and the scope, opening my doors for practice and uh, having education events. So so tell us about the education events. I mean, I think this is important. And, you know, when I first started in this work myself a million years ago, I started having these monthly live public events in a cocktail bar. We call them the Pleasure Forum. I held them in a cocktail bar because... You know, alcohol is the natural habitat of the Australian. I don't know if you knew that. But, I didn't know. Uh, that. Wherever there's an Australian, wherever there's an Australian, there's booze. <laughs> but yeah, I, I held these uh, sex education events in a bar because you know it's comfortable, and and sex is about being comfortable. But I, the the whole gist of it is, I wanted folks to be comfortable. I wanted them to feel like they were getting useful, kind of clinically backed information, but they weren't. In a, in a clinic, they weren't getting it from somebody in a lab coat telling them this is how you do it. You know, and I brought in community leaders from like the BDSM community and sex work communities and polyamory community and, you know, all the different intersecting, the Tantra folks. And there was such a need for it. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear your experience of running public adult sex education events. How what How is it going for you? So I'm still in the beginning stages of it. I was just like, I have to start doing education. I have to start getting my face out there. And a friend of mine referred me to this couple in this city in Texas called Louisville. And so I went to Louisville. I I checked out their shop. I was like, this is a a great place for me to have sex education courses. And they're like, well, we do those here. I was like, wait, 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 what? So they had um, they had a person there that was familiar with a lot of the sexual stuff you use in bed and she would teach them how to use, you know, a certain dildo, flogger or whatever else. But that's kind of where it stopped. It didn't really go into the history of BDSM, not necessarily what it stood for. It was just an example of what it is and how to use these toys. And so I wanted to present something a little bit more comprehensive to people in the area. Mm. And in Louisville, it was really just uh, a lot of soccer moms that (laughs) stayed around there. So I would do certain things like bring in other folks or I would do something like uh, I did a class on on flirting and seduction. Ooh, 
And so we <laughs> talked about <laughs> so we talked about flirting and seduction. I thought that was something that wasn't too over the top, something that people were kind of familiar with. And we brought in BDSM. We brought in people that did example, live examples of BDSM, appropriate touch. And was that specifically targeted at, at the black community or that was a, a for everybody kind of thing? I made an effort to reach out to the black community. So did the uh, the couple that owned the store. And there's this uh, site called blackdallas.com. And so we would, we would advertise pretty heavily on that for the black community to come out and just kind of get their feet wet on what's going on in the, in the sexual health realm. I wanted people to kind of get on, on, on par as to what the verbiage and the language is in the sexual health realm. Because I feel like that's a very, a very big piece that's missing with a lot of people. Yeah. And so that's... That's also another thing that I go along with trying to teach. Absolutely. And being able to access language and having permission to talk about sex out loud in public is like yeah. for so many people is, you know, a big a big portion of it. Just yeah. that it's not something that it happens, you know, quietly in the dark in your bedroom with yeah. the lights off under the covers so nobody can see. That's boring. I want. I want to see what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah, jiggly bits and your whatever your bits that hang out and the bits of hair that you didn't shave off properly and you know that that all that obscured kind of hiding in the shadows thing. Which you know I get why people do that. And at the same time, it's like when they come to see people like us, it's because they don't want to live like that anymore. They want to experience what else is there. You know. Yeah. You know, sex is funny, it's terrifying, it's heavy, it's light, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. It can make me really pissed off sometimes. It can be the absolute light and golden moment of my day. Uh, and that's just in an hour. So, <laughs> but I, you know, you I've been doing this. 23 other hours ago. Really, What's going on? You know? <laughs> and I've been doing this work for 20 years, more than 20 years in some capacity. And I'm still not bored with it yet. Most other stuff bores the shit out of me, but sex does not. It, it's, it's that motivational factor. It keeps you going in the morning. Yeah. You know, uh, masturbation helps you out throughout the day. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, too. you know, you know just, <laughs> just do what you got to do. Keep yourself in the game and motivated. Exactly. So as we sort of start to wrap the conversation up for today, Greg, if folks wanted to reach out to you from any corner of the world of any orientation, race, gender, whatever, how would they find you? Kaya Today is my website, my private practice website where I do teletherapy. Kaya stands for Come As You Are. So C-A-Y-A. C-A-Y-A. And then my phone number is 214-945-9006. And there's also Compassion, C-O-M-E dash P-A-S-S-I-O-N dot com. Uh, and that is my sex education and party site uh -huh. where, you know, you can order lingerie, uh, you can get your sex toys, you'll also see video blogs and also sex blogs and uh, a number of other things. And the biggest piece of that is we're going to start incorporating uh, a safety feature for people called Compassionate Communities. It's a, it's a GPS map and you can plot safe and unsafe places for you, whether let's say you're trans and you know that this place over here is not trans friendly, ah. well, you can put that on the map. So, so people are aware of safe and non-safe places to go, and so you can be your sexual self. That is fabulous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like we were just saying here today, we have to create spaces for us to be our sexual selves. And, you know, technology is a hot place to do that. And so why not with the, uh, the compassion community feature? Thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. I'm so thrilled that we, we managed to get this time together to talk about what appears to be both of our favorite subjects. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I hope I look forward to being able to do some work with you again in some other capacity in person or, or yeah, online, some of the stuff that we talked about. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy, and I'll be hearing from you soon, I hope. Yeah, yeah, you will, you will. <laughs> Hello, listeners. To submit an erotic quandary for the philosophers to ponder, follow The Erotic Philosopher on Instagram and Twitter at The Erotic Philos, that's P-H-I-L-O-S, and click on the Google Form link in the bio and to discover more about my online sexology courses as well as how to work with me directly, head on over to cindydarnell.com. 
That's C-Y-N-D-I-D-A-R-N-E-L-L dot com. Thanks for listening.